Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Marcus, for that very kind introduction. I, I have been around for a long time. I'm no spring chicken, as you can see, and I was first elected for Inverness East near the Loch Haber constituency back in 1999, 20 years ago, and it had three distinctions. Constituency had the highest mountain in the UK, the deepest loch, and the most discerning and intelligent of electorates. Um, but it's a real pleasure to be here, Marcus. I'm afraid I do have to go after the speech to go back to be grilled at uh, Holyrood, although I'm happy to take questions uh, from you at the end of what I have to say, except with one caveat. Please do not ask me under any circumstances how the Brexit saga will unfold. If I knew the answer to that, I would be rich and popular and any effective politician operating in the law should be neither of those things. Um, I'm a, a passionate advocate of our seafood industry and I know some of you here and I've worked with some of you here over the years and enjoy doing so because we have a marvelous industry worth a huge amount of money, three billion pounds, it's world leading. The reputation that we have for the quality of our produce and the cl clean, cleanliness of our waters is something I became aware of at one of the Glen Eagles uh, uh, in market summits where uh, delegates and business people from the Singapore end of the world bemoaned the pollution in their waters and the purity of our waters and our product. Uh, and that perspective remained with me because it's easy to forget that. Uh, and the, the reputation that we have not only fuels success in the fish sector, but that spreads out to other parts of the food and drink sector, enables other businesses to build on your success worldwide. Uh, and the seafood demand across the world is increasing. Consumption has more than doubled in the past 50 years. That could only increase, if you think about it, the amount of arable land is finite in the world and is almost in every case already being used. The potential for more protein lies in the world's seas and oceans. Uh, and that's all illustrated by the success <coughs> of our exports with 111% uh, uh, increase over the past 10 years, more than doubling what we did just 10 years ago. And that's really thanks to the success of many people in this room, in the industry, throughout the country. Uh, fishermen, processors, businesses, all operating, working hard and and delivering for Scotland. To contrast, in England, C4 exports only account for 6% of food exports. They are 60% of food exports in Scotland, 10 times more important to Scotland than in England. And hence our, our interest, our enthusiasm, and our desire to do everything that we can to assist in your success. And of course, what you do is absolutely vital to sustain our coastal and fragile communities. And as long as I'm the Cabinet Secretary, that will be an absolute priority in trying to do my best to further the interests of the fishermen and fishing interests in those communities. Almost 5,000 people work on Scottish registered fishing vessels, and there are over 8,000 jobs in seafood processing across Scotland. Uh, and aquaculture, including the supply chain, supports over 12,000 jobs, many of them in rural areas. <coughs> I was speaking to Stuart Graham of Gale Force Marine a couple of weeks ago. Uh, his success in feed barges is now being extended into manufacturing remotely operated sea pens as a form of engineering business, uh, and he's making breakthroughs in other parts of the world as well. So the Scottish supply chain is something that we wish to see grow in all sectors. But the sector does face challenges from the consequences of leaving the EU. Yes, there are potential opportunities and potential challenges. Nobody can be absolutely certain about how all this will unfold. But the message I want to convey to you at the highest level is I want to grab the opportunities if they prove to, to be realizable and I want to overcome the challenges with you. Those are the two key approaches that I bring to this as a pragmatist. However the cards fall, the Brexit cards fall on the table. My job as your minister is to make the most of any opportunities uh, and do everything we can to overcome the challenges. A no deal Brexit would, I believe, have the potential to have severe and disproportionate impacts on Scotland in general, on 
on food supply, on medicines and transport and rural matters, it's expected that the availability and price of some foods and drink are likely to be significantly uh, affected. I gather that salad and fruit uh, uh, may be first in the line to be in scarce supply, something that I did somewhat facetiously point out may not be an insuperable obstacle to some of our good friends and citizens in the west of Scotland, but nonetheless, uh, there are foreseeable threats about limiting the range and choice of goods available in supermarkets. You may say, well, we've got a stupendously huge choice anyway, but uh, to be serious, there are risks for some sectors. Uh, seed potatoes, uh, for, for example, uh, sheep, uh, lamb, which are particularly exposed to the EU market and loss of that market could have a devastating effect, particularly for the small farmer, uh, as indeed the small, uh, the, the inshore sector and fishing, I think, are perhaps nearest to the, the Brexit fire in the event of a no deal. Access to markets are, of course, critical, with seven out of the 10 Scottish Seafood's top export markets or EU states accounting for 77% of exports by value. So, you know, this is a major deal. The potential risks, and I use the word potential because nobody can be absolutely certain how this will play out, but the potential risks could be very significant indeed. Uh, uh, and of course, if there are non-tariff barriers, such as the increased requirement for certification of goods, customs checks, and delays at ports, uh, these all have the potential to be extremely damaging. Just before Christmas, I uh, uh, visited Eyemouth and had a discussion with DR Collins. And at that point, if you remember, the Gilets Jaunes demonstrations were perhaps at their peak. And that was something which was seen as a risk to supply chain, to delivery by DR Collins of produce to Italy and Spain. So if you can imagine that something like that, a, an isolated event for affecting one country could impact on uh, non-tariff uh, issues could impact on the shellfish sector, for example, then you can imagine how much more serious it would be if the whole of Europe uh, became, uh, for us as a third country, an area where non-tariff barriers applies. Um, access to labour is already an issue, uh, and migrant labour shortages could affect the seafood sector. In Grampian, 70% of the workforce in the seafood processing sector are non UK EU nationals, the highest levels in UK fishing and processing. Um, and on funding, as Marcus has said, it's not clear what funding will replace the EU schemes such as EMFF and how future quotas will be arranged within the UK. Um, now, it's not possible for us fully to mitigate the impacts as limits to what governments can do, uh, but we have taken actions to minimise disruption in so far uh, as is possible. On export health certificates, we've developed an agreed approach with local authorities, uh, Food Standards Scotland, and now the UK government to deliver a pragmatic solution to meet the requirements of the EU. Uh, this, this would involve uh, extending the EHO uh, route with compliance officers who would be able to deal with the greater volume of EHCs required. The agriculture sector have estimated, I think, that the current 50,000 a year they would go to 200,000 a year at an additional cost of 15 million pounds. So we're talking about a big bureaucratic potential problem here and we've been working with all the other bodies and with the, the SSPO, with yourselves, in order to try to find a practical workaround. And I know that your own, I gather from brief discussions this morning, you're looking at uh, solutions involving boulogne mer and other solutions, and that's quite right, and we want to continue to work with you on all of these, and Marcus with Seafood Scotland, to scope out alternative routes to market, possibly using air freight from Scotland, although I appreciate that, that almost certainly would involve quite considerable additional expense. Uh, we have also engaged with all of the major retailers in the UK. I had a phone round of nine major supermarkets uh, in, in confidence and discussion with them and their approach. Uh, and my ask is always that they consider doing what they can to source more Scottish produce. And I have to say that my dealings with them have almost in every case been constructive and positive. And the impression I get is that uh, they take, they, they, the major players in the food sector, uh, some of your customers, I suspect, uh, take their responsibilities very seriously and they want to do what they can in order to help deal with any practical problems that arise in the event of a no deal 
and certainly there's lots of preparations and plans that they have put in place to deal with that. We have also asked our 14 in-market specialists based in cities across the world to assess the further market opportunities for Scottish seafood. And I'm determined that whatever the Brexit cards, however they fall on the table, we've got a great product and we have the potential to promote it further to markets throughout the world. I do feel that that's an untapped potential and I do want to work with you here to see how in practice together we can tackle that with industry-led solutions seeking markets, in some cases new or largely new markets throughout the world. Both Seafish and our enterprise agencies have developed websites to support business, um, prepare for Brexit, where a range of practical information uh, can be found. And I believe there are three leaflets there, which, uh, which uh, my lovely assistant will hand up to me. And here we are, there. There are three leaflets which Marine Scotland have prepared uh, about how to deal with some of the practicalities. So, you know, these are practical documents. Please uh, take these away and get, use the advice from Marine uh, Scotland. But we also do need the UK government better to recognise the importance of the seafood sector and support our efforts. Uh, and we have directly asked them to do th several things. Firstly, to link the EU's requested dynamic alignment to specific trade issues to remove the need for export health certificates or border inspections. Uh, secondly, to allocate space on their uh, ferry contracts for seafood exports. And thirdly, as part of any traffic management arrangements implemented to control traffic at Dover to prioritise seafood lorries and to prioritise deliveries of goods which are perishable and therefore any delay of which uh, could render the consignments valueless. Uh, I was disappointed when I raised this with Michael Gove at a meeting on Monday that uh, the, the possibility of any form of prioritization of any perishable goods appears to have been ruled out by the UK at this stage, uh, citing <coughs> practical difficulties. Uh, I, I think we will press, we will press this, the UK further on this. I don't think it's beyond the wit of man to provide a means of enabling such prioritization for obvious sound commercial reasons. Uh, and without going into the detail of the conversation we had on Monday in London, we will continue to press the UK government on this and other matters. Despite the uncertainties of Brexit, we are working closely with the industry to map out a future framework to support both the catching and the processing sector. Our food and drink strategy, Ambition 2030, which was developed in partnership with industry, sets out a clear ambition to double the value uh, of the overall sector to 30 billion by 2030. And the seafood industry is at the heart of that growth. Uh, I'm confident that you have the potential to deliver on achieving that target. After all, you've doubled your export performance in the last 10 years. So you have the potential to do so again if we can overcome the practical and logistical challenges and we can promote Scotland abroad as we do effectively, but redouble those efforts in future years. Uh, so um, we'll continue to invest in exports, we'll continue to seek market opportunities, and we'll continue to work with you about how best to do that uh, most effectively. I want to talk briefly about future fisheries management in Scotland, and Marcus referred to that. We published a national discussion paper in Orkney um, earlier this month on the future of sea fisheries. Uh, we are seeking to develop a world-class fisheries management system for our Scottish waters. The discussion paper marks uh, 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 the opportunity for a real debate in Scotland about this. Uh, following on the discussion paper, we will consult formally uh, on proposals on a fisheries management strategy around the end of this year. We've had initial discussion with uh, many of you. There are many principles and policies contained in the common fisheries policy which are sensible. This isn't about change for the sake of it, but adjusting our approach where improvements can be made. So we're committed to taking a principled approach to fisheries management. We need to ensure a clean, healthy, safe and productive seas and the future of our fishing sector uh, as a whole. So I just wanted to run through the key, uh, the key principles. 
Firstly, maintaining our commitment to international law and working with other countries to ensure sustainability. Secondly, taking an ecosystem approach to fisheries management. Thirdly, ensuring the interests of all marine and seafood sectors, including small businesses, are taken into account to deliver sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Setting fishing limits in line with best scientific advice. Contributing to fish stock data and analysis and improving the quality of our evidence base. Taking a sensible approach to minimising discards and tackling unnecessary waste. Creating an environment where fishing is seen as an attractive career of choice. <coughs> Supporting fishing and onshore seafood industries of all sizes to grow sustainably and be internationally competitive. Uh, we're also committed to supporting and developing our seafood and processing uh, and aquaculture sectors. Uh, even with Brexit, the processing sector continues to face challenges. Uh, I know that the margins are small and are being squeezed with increases uh, in the price of fish, customers expecting lower costs and increased costs in materials, rates, energy and utilities. And this is exacerbated by the uncertainty around Brexit, which has impacted on the value of the pound and created a tougher trading environment for the sector. But we are working closely with stakeholders, including Jimmy Buchan, who's here with us today, and the Scottish Seafood Association to address these challenges, including continuing to target our EMF grants to support capital investment with 11.6 million provided over the past three years to processing businesses in Scotland. Um, uh, and I've been pleased to, to uh, play a part in, in, in some of these uh, grant awards which are very important to allow some of the businesses to develop and grow with their facilities and expending cap capex with some assistance in order to do that. Working with Zero Waste Scotland to develop a bespoke energy efficiency programme and investing £100,000 to raising standards across the industry through an enhanced accreditation programme, SALSA and BRC. So, <clears throat> in conclusion, thank you for listening to me this morning. I, I would like, actually, before I close, to thank Marcus and Seafish, uh, not only for the opportunity to address this summit today, but also to highlight the tremendous work that Seafish does, in particular in areas such as responsible sourcing, safety, training and research, uh, and also the ongoing work of the Scottish Seafish Advisory Committee, chaired by Mike Park. Uh, and I, I'd like to take the opportunity to stress that we intend to continue to work very closely to collaborate with all of you through these uh, turbulent and unpredictable times. I remain at your disposal uh, so far as I can in order to help pursue the shared common objectives. Uh, and in conclusion, whatever the opportunities are, we will grab them. And whatever the challenges are, we will work with you to overcome them for the good of the future of one of Scotland's greatest and finest industries that we have. Thank you very much indeed. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take the easy ones, and Alan over there will answer the, the difficult ones. We sorted that out earlier. But, uh. <laughs> Could I ask a question, Minister? Sure, Jimmy. Uh, well, no, it's not really for private ears. I mean, I have, Jimmy, had discussions with, with, uh, with some of you about uh, marketing. And the principle here is what I mentioned earlier, that, you know, government can, can do things, but really industry is best placed to do most of the things itself. What, what can government and government bodies and public bodies do? Well, we can help you achieve your aims. But I think we have to be guided by industry you know, as to what the best opportunities are. I do, never felt that it's the right thing for a minister or public servants, no matter how intelligent, informed, gifted they are, sitting in an office in Edinburgh to determine what the best markets are. You collectively will know where those are. It has been put to me by some of you and by Ian McSween, who I spent a lot of time discussing this, as, uh, as I did with, uh, with uh, Richard Lockhead, that markets in the Far East, in Japan, for example, which have been dominated by other countries, notably Norway, I believe, uh, have the potential 
uh, to uh, provide great opportunities for Scotland. I just mentioned that because it's been mentioned by your, your peers, Jimmy. Uh, but I think yourself and others in this room, and Mike and uh, a whole range of you who are operating in the, uh, in, in the fishing sector and in the processing sector are probably best placed to guide our efforts. What I'm saying is that if we want to achieve the 30 billion target, then plainly, essentially, what we're doing at the moment has to be, in effect, doubled. Doubled. That's, that's the target. Uh, and uh, why not be ambitious? We have the potential to do it. People love our produce all the world over. We have a great reputation. Provided we keep that reputation, uh, then we have the potential to do an awful lot more. It's all about accessing the markets. And the last thing I would say is that SDI have 14 market in-house market specialists. When I came into this job, I thought, what are they all doing? And you do sometimes you know, worry about what's the, the Mail on Sunday going to, to say. Are they going to say that there's 14 people playing golf or going to the pictures throughout the world at the taxpayer's expense? You know, these, these, are, these are considerations that uh, you spend some time uh, contemplating. So I decided to meet them, and I've met them several times. Uh, and these 14 in-house in market specialists working throughout the world, including in Singapore and Japan, in California and Berlin, uh, and all parts of the compass, have delivered uh, 40 or 50 million pounds of benefits between the 14 of them. A tremendous investment, a sales force for Scotland. So if 14 people can do that, working with businesses across the whole food and drink sector, it shows the potential is almost limitless. The only constraints are practical, getting enough supply, logistics, supply chain, transport, certification. Those are the practical barriers that I think we, we all appreciate need to be overcome. Many of you spend your life doing this, and therefore it's absolutely right that we listen to you, Jimmy, and others about how to do that. But the potential is there, there's no doubt about that, and I think working together uh, once the Brexit dust has settled, uh, whatever happens, whatever happens, we have the opportunity to grab a bigger share of a growing market throughout the world for high quality fish products. John. Secretary, you touched on overheads facing the processors. Could you expand on any opportunities to address the business rates element and how that can be reconfigured to, to grow the capacity in processing? Yeah. Um, well, I, I know that business rates is, is something that's uh, a, a, a considerable worry to processors from meetings, John, that I've had uh, with processors, and this has been pursued by Kate Forbes, uh, who is effectively the Deputy Finance Minister. I know Kate has met with, with Jimmy and others recently to discuss this. There has been, a, a, I think the, there are two concerns. One, they're too high, and one, they're higher than England. Uh, I think I've seen the table, the technical table, comparing the business rates uh, applicable to processors in Peterhead, uh, Aberdeen, with English ports. And the conclusions, so far as I understand it, that have been drawn by us, where the, there is no evidence that the business rates are higher uh, in uh, Scotland than in England. They're on a par, except that in Aberdeen, because the cost of premises, business rates, of course, is based on notional rental. <coughs> it's based on... Um, various somewhat artificial assumptions, but at the end of the day, the evidence used by the assessors to assess the rateable values is based on market evidence, and because the value of property in Aberdeen is, has been traditionally very much higher because of oil and gas, the business rates in Aberdeen processors have been significantly higher, for example, than Peter Head. Uh, I don't think, I mean, it, uh, it's not an easy issue to, to solve. Uh, I, I can't uh, offer you any kind of uh, promises. If I if I did, I, I would repent at, at leisure with good friends in the press here here to record the proceedings, uh, and I generally don't do that anyway. But I think we need to continue to work with you to make sure that uh, that that, that uh, we fully understand the problem. Uh, I know that Kate spent a long time looking at this, and I was part of that because I felt that there might be a case that rates were higher in Scotland than in England, <coughs> and indeed. Um, when we first came to government in 2007, we restored the uniform business rate, something that had been decoupled in the eight years prior to our inception as a government. So I was a part of the move to end the higher business rates and the poundage that existed from 1999 until 2007. But that's, I suppose, ancient history now. Um, the last thing I would say is that local authorities do have 
discretionary power to reduce business rates. I think uh, that has been raised with them, and the answer, so far as I know, has been in the negative, but that discretionary power is there. Yes, Damien. Insightful speech you made. Oh, sorry. Um, can you, or, sh or the question is actually, have you met the new fisheries ministers down in London yet? And uh, yeah. do you see, uh, uh, like his predecessor, an opportunity to try and take the politics out of yeah. fisheries? Uh, yes, I have. I met uh, Robert Goodwill just on, on Monday. I'd had a, a sort of introductory chat with him over the phone prior to that. Um, and uh, I think I can work with him. I'm keen to try, frankly, to take the politics out of situations. It's easier if you're dealing with problems on a rational basis rather than to partisan political basis, in my, in my view. Um, and uh, I found that, I think, as you know, I was able to do that substantially with George Eustace uh, at the meeting in London on Monday that I attended with Michael Gove, Leslie Griffiths from Wales and the, the Irish Permanent Secretary in the absence of an administration in Northern Ireland. I asked that it be noted that I thanked George Eustace for his work. I think, um, you know, I'm on record as saying not only did I have a constructive relationship, but I think he did have a solid grasp of the complexities uh, of the common fisheries policy, down to the detail uh, of uh, the, uh, the quota system, the total allowable catches in each of the zones, uh, and a reasonable understanding of all of these things built on several years of experience. So I'm quite happy to say that I felt that George Eustace was somebody, although uh, an English fisheries minister, nonetheless had a solid grasp of the topic, and also in the negotiations which we attended together for the last three years in Brussels, um, we uh, worked reasonably well together, and I think, as you, again, you know, because you've attended, you know, the, the politics were kind of pushed, pushed aside for the most part. Um, <coughs> um, but the other thing I would say is that, you know, fishing is much more important to Scotland than it is to England. It's very important in the Scottish Government. It regularly is mentioned and discussed in our Cabinet discussions. Um, I don't mean this to be political, but it's not really so high up on the agenda in the scale of kind of industrial priorities in England, the scale of jobs, the scale of value to the economy. I mentioned the export figures earlier on as one uh, sort of adminical of evidence of that. And therefore, I'm not persuaded that, that the importance of fishing is recognized in Whitehall to the same extent as it is uh, in St. Andrew's House. I think that's really just a fact. And it can be quite difficult, I'm afraid, to get solutions to problems, problems that have arisen even in my time. Uh, about, for example, blue whiting, about the Faroese, uh, uh, the, the secret Faroese deal. Uh, it's been difficult to get traction on some of these issues, and I don't think that's going to change. It's not easy dealing with Whitehall. At best, it's slow, far, far too slow, uh, and at worst, it can be, you feel that, uh, that there's not always the desire to reach a solution on matters, frankly, that could be quickly resolve the quota swaps, availabilities of quotas to POs and, and things of that order. And dealing with the MMO is, uh, has not exactly been a bowl of cherries either. So uh, uh, that's a non-ministerial phrase, I suppose. So yes, George Eustace was a good guy. I was sorry to see him leave. I didn't quite understand why he left, actually. But uh, Robert Goodwill is somebody I think we can do business with. He told me that he had a good relationship with Keith Brown uh, when he was in, I think, I think Robert's done been round the houses and portfolios. <laughs> uh, so we had a good relationship with one of my colleagues. We started off in friendly terms on Monday when we, we met, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm reasonably confident, uh, David, that that will, that will continue to be the case, notwithstanding that we'll, we will miss George's uh, undoubted grasp of his brief. I'm not sure I'm supposed to be so complimentary of the UK government. I hope this... <laughs> Oh, this doesn't get me into trouble, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, there we are, c'est la vie. I wouldn't say that about all the ministers, but... Uh, Mr Ewing, I'm going to thank okay. you on behalf right. of thank everybody. Uh, we, we've kept you far longer, yep. and, and I made you stand in the car park and have a picture of, with me right. with a okay. tray of fish, which was uh, above and beyond, I think. So um, your, your passion for Scotland and your well, passion for this industry Well, the juice fell in your shoe, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you'll get the bill for that later. Thanks but, very much. Uh, thank really you. appreciate it. Thank okay. you very much thank, indeed. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you.